Okay. I'm Elizabeth Coe, the C Chief Executive of the National Association of Child Contact Centres, and I'm accompanied today by Phil Coleman, who's the Service Development Manager, and John Douglas from Information Age. Um, as you know, it's been well over two years now since GDPR came into force, and whether we like it or not, we have had the pressure of finding new ways of working and evidencing our compliance with this. Whilst this was a huge challenge, um, initially, everyone did finally achieve this, uh, and as things develop, the Information Commissioner's Office have started to look at new ways of ensuring compliance and reducing the number of data breaches that take place. This is not Endeavour Morse or DCI Barnaby. It's not riveting, it's not exciting, but it is something you need to know about. Therefore, the NAC and Information Age have been working with the ICO to develop a code of conduct. This will make everyone's life a little easier and drive down certification costs for most. So it's my pleasure to welcome John Douglas from Information Age, who will provide us with an update and an idea of what lies ahead for us. As you, as you know, in uh, 2018, the GDPR was introduced. And at that time, we had to take measures to ensure that all the child contact centres were fully GDPR compliant. Uh, having had discussions with CAFCAS and others, uh, we decided that the best approach would be to get uh, the IASME Cyber Essentials uh, facility uh, to uh, ensure that everyone was certified. However, there was a significant issue in that a large portion of the uh, contact centres, particularly the, the micro contact centres, uh, found the uh, cost of £360, uh, which includes VAT, unaffordable. So what we did was to have some discussions with the, the, the DPO, uh, Data Protection Officer, at CAFCAS about what uh, alternatives there would be. And we agreed that we would be able to develop a micro system uh, for the smaller uh, organizations so they could answer just a few questions and the fee for that would be significantly lower. Um, <clears throat> that um, approach assumed that at the time uh, there was no formal mechanism for uh, the, uh, for the ICO to validate GDPR. Uh, what has happened since, in fact, early this year, the code of conduct has been introduced by uh, the uh, ICO, which would enable us to go for a formal ICO uh, accreditation, replacing the micro system and also the requirement for the uh, Cyber Essentials IASME uh, certification for the larger organisations. Um, that requires us to fulfil certain obligations uh, in terms of cyber security and compliance, uh, which we have to agree with the, uh, with the ICO. What has now happened <coughs> is that back in January, we approached the ICO about this and started discussions. Uh, we've now got to the stage where we have a draft code of conduct that is now available for you to look at um, and we will produce a summary uh, to give you the salient points uh, and I'll go through essentially uh, what it uh, uh, what it entails. Uh, we've stated that, that a code of conduct is needed because we need to give full assurance to all the stakeholders in the child contact centres uh, that we are fully compliant, that the personal information we're having is held uh, meeting the legal standards and good practice as required by the ICO. Uh, the membership of the Code of Conduct will provide that assurance. However, what the ICO requires us to do is to have a 
formal method of monitoring compliance. And what we are uh, therefore doing is to uh, produce for the ICO a monitoring scheme which involves uh, a regular uh, remote monitoring of um, the computer systems to make sure they're patched, etc., that all the documents are in place and that they will, uh, that, that the right procedures are being followed. Uh, the, there will therefore be a requirement for a full audit of each child contact centre every three years. Compliance requires um, the uh, awareness, that is the, the right level of training for the people who are involved in handling personal data, definitions of all the information that is held and what it is used for, that will be supported like we did previously with providing a template, uh, which is the data uh, uh, processes uh, template. Um, the requirements for notifications and a privacy policy, uh, formal data retention policies, um, uh, the compliance with subject access rights and the procedures associated with it, a definition of the lawful basis uh, for the um, holding each item of data, and we will provide templates to cover that. Uh, procedures for uh, content, uh, consent uh, so that individuals will um, have a, if necessary, provide formal consents and a record of consents. Um, the uh, data breach procedures so that you know what to do in case of data breaches um, and the um, and a data uh, protection uh, impact assessment, which actually uh, we will again provide you a template for. Uh, what we're doing is extending the process we did with the micro systems so that there will be standard architectures so you'll know how to put your systems together. Uh, people are using things like uh, Google Drive, uh, Office 365 or Microsoft 365 as it is now. Um, they will be using um, systems like, um, uh, I think Google has been used. Some people are using just email, keeping things on paper. Some people, the larger organizations will still want their, um, uh, to run their own in-house systems and under those circumstances, we'll have to talk through with them precisely how that compliance can be monitored. Uh, all um, workstations, for instance, will have to be encrypted. Uh, passwords will have to be strong. Uh, everything would have to be patched within 14 days, etc. So all of those uh, come through in terms of compliance. Um, the uh, cyber security requirements are follow something which is called the uh, cyber security framework. It's similar to ISO 27001. In fact, it covers almost everything that ISO 27001 is, covers as well as cyber essentials and something called the minimum cyber security standard, which is produced by NCSC, National Cyber Security Center. Uh, but what we've tried to do is keep the number of questions and issues uh, through the standard architectures somewhat limited. So I hope we'll be able to keep it down to about 20 questions rather than the 160 <laughs> that um, are currently required for, uh, uh, for cyber uh, essentials. Uh, so we're trying to make it uh, quite a lot simpler uh, to comply but a perhaps a little more prescriptive. We're also doing something that wasn't included in um, Cyber Essentials or for that matter, uh, the explicit frameworks except for the minimum cyber security standard, which is give strict guidance on the use of email, avoiding spam, avoiding things like uh, uh, people uh, 
presenting themselves as you and not being you, etc. So uh, all of those technologies are included in the code, but we will also provide guidance on how those can be implemented. Uh, the result is that, uh, oh sorry, the other thing obviously is backup and recovery. We're going to uh, ensure that uh, in case of loss, of significant loss of any data, there, is me there are means of recovery. And code members uh, will have to have a backup and recovery procedures. The, um, I think probably one of the things you're going to be most interested in is how much this is all going to cost you. Um, the objective that we've set is that for the largest organisations, their costs will be no more than the current cyber essentials requirement. Uh, so if effectively, that will be the maximum cost. But for the majority of organizations, because we don't have to pay the fees to NCSC, and ICO provide the, uh, the guarantor process uh, free of charge, we should be able to reduce the costs for most, apart from, uh, for most organisations, apart from the uh, very largest, which will stay as they are at the moment. Um, we will possibly need to have some discussions about those people who hold uh, ISO 27001 and those that, uh, that haven't got, uh, or that have got cyber essentials through other processes, um, but uh, that we'll sort out uh, as we work through the process. The other issue that you may be interested in is insurance. At the moment, those large organizations with IASME governance uh, certification get uh, free annual insurance. Um, uh, we have started talking to some insurance brokers about the possibility of cyber insurance so there will be an option uh, for that. Uh, and that, uh, and uh, we hope uh, that the first pilot, uh, pilot uh, centers will be able to operate uh, within the code of conduct by the end of the year with the plan of rolling it out through 2021. Uh, and the rollout will be synchronized so that uh, existing certifications uh, will be replaced by the code of conduct at the end of the uh, of, of their current certification. So if you're due to uh, have a cyber essentials renewal on uh, in June 21, uh, we'll switch it at that point to the uh, to the code. As far as the ICO is concerned, and uh, perhaps Elizabeth could explain this uh, afterwards. As far as the ICO is concerned, the code of conduct is uh, applies to all NAC members, and therefore it is it won't be optional um, uh, as far as the ICO is concerned, and uh, it's unlikely that we'll be able to claim that we cover a specific sector if all members don't uh, don't join. Yeah. Uh, a key aspect that the ICO require of the codes is that there is a formal complaints process. That is, if a data subject wishes to complain about a child contact centre, they complain through the code of conduct procedures initially um, and uh, that means that to a, largely it is kept within our control. If the complainant wants to take it further then, they make a complaint about the monitoring body, uh, and which is again us, and then uh, they can finally appeal to the ICO. So largely, most of the issues that arise through uh, complaints will be handled internally by us rather than going out to a legal framework. Okay, 
Uh, John, I heard you mention some of the pros and cons of the Code of Conduct earlier in your speech. I wonder whether you could summarise why the Code of Conduct makes more sense than the previous way we managed this. I think there are three points. The first is that it will be properly assured by the ICO. And uh, what, we've what we will have is an ICO recognised uh, qualification. The second is that uh, the, we were given a uh, derogation by CAFCAS to use the micro scheme uh, until the code of conduct became an option that was available to us. Uh, we, we, we will run out of that derogation in 2021. The third is that it's designed for us and tailored for our requirements and is geared to our level of risk and the level of control that we need. So it is ours rather than something that's been imposed by an external body. OK, thank you. Uh, the second question is, you have outlined the future in terms of direction of travel. I wonder whether you could give us more idea about the potential timescales associated with this. OK, um, we hope to have the code of conduct approved uh, or in uh, a, an initial approval from the ICO towards the end of uh, October, November. We've already submitted our first drafts to them for comment. We've had the comments back and we've provided, uh, we've updated the, in line with those comments. Uh, we have to go through, and this is the start of it, a consultation process. Um, and that consultation process we're seeing would last through it up till November. And at that point, once the consultation process is completed, we believe we'll get the go ahead from the ICO. Uh, we will then get uh, one or two contact centres to implement and become code members in December, perhaps January. And then we then start a rollout so that individual organisations can replace their current certification with a new code of conduct membership. OK, thank you. Um, I'm wondering if you could give us some more information in terms of rollout. An example is if a centre has their certificate due to expire in October, Will they be enrolling for a renewal of what they had last year or will they be enrolling onto the code of conduct? Uh, once we pass the pilot level, so in early 2021, anyone who's due for renewal will then switch to the code of conduct. OK, and in a very practical sense, what difference will this change make to centres and the processes they developed since GDPR was implemented? Uh, not a huge amount. The major difference is that we will be reflecting the additional risks that we've defined over the period and we would be looking to improve the level of cyber security and compliance in line with the guidance that's, guidance that's emerged. Uh, and I should just mention in passing the B word uh, and that is that the code of conduct will be based on the UK version of GDPR uh, and we won't necessarily need to comply with the other uh, modifications that come through through the uh, European Court of Justice, etc. So, okay. for instance, uh, the issue that uh, people may have with the uh, use of Microsoft, Google, Amazon, etc., that will appear after 2021 uh, with um, should uh, at that point disappear. OK, well, thank you for spending the time and helping us to understand all of this information, John. There's a lot to take in and I'm sure it will take a little while for people to digest it. However, it's important to keep children's information safe and the work of uh, John and Information Age and the NAC team will try to make it easier for you to do this. All right, thank you. Thank you.